Welcome back and you are still on to Cosmopolitan Market on the Nigeria Customs Broadcasting Network. And if you're just joining us, you haven't missed so much as our discussion segment is just about to commence. And of course, there are discussions ar around the rising insecurity in Nigeria. And most people are of the opinion that there is a strong nexus between insecurity and economic activities. However, we are going to discuss issues around that on today's uh, um, edition of the program. And I am now joined by my guest. He is Dr. Badaya Malafia. He is the former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And he is joining me to discuss and dissect issues around insecurity and economic development. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you so very much. Uh, I appreciate you having me. Thank you, as always, for obliging us and, and joining us on the program to discuss these issues. I, I, I believe it's only ideal for us to start by discussing uh, um, the, the, rise, the rise in insecurity uh, across the nation. Uh, initially, it used to be a thing of the Northeast. However, we are seeing this not just happen in the Northeast, but spread across all, all, all sectors or all areas uh, in the nation. How complex or how alarming would you say the case of insecurity is as we speak right now? Well, it is very, very alarming. Uh, the facts and figures are very clear. Um, a survey was done recently, like I, I just received it this morning. And uh, in the month of January this year alone, uh, almost 2,000 people were certified killed mm. uh, in uh, not only the Northeast, but Northwest, North Central. And it's further moving down south. We're seeing increased space of killings and, and kidnappings and uh, all sorts of atrocities uh, being uh, committed uh, by terrorists, really, that uh, are given the anodyne uh, name of, of bandits. Now, just two days ago, the um, governor of Niger State uh, was uh, heard raising the alarm that Niger State has been invaded by the terrorists, uh, which means that they are just about 200 kilometers to reaching the federal capital of Abuja. Uh, you know, people are very worried. Uh, in fact, I have never seen this mood before. This mood of sorrow, fear, alarm, not even in the days of the civil war. And I was a child uh, that was aware of what was going on. I've never seen such fear in the faces of Nigerians. Mm. Alarm, you know, absolute panic. Nobody knows what will happen. And uh, grief, you know, uh, defenseless people. Mm. You know, recently the Greenfield University in Kaduna, where they took many of the students as, as, uh, into captivity, mm. uh, they killed about three of them the other day, and they promised that they would be killing two every day until their demand of 800 million naira is paid up. Mm. I don't know where the parents of this poor kids are going to pay, are going to find 800 million to pay this, this monster. So that's really where we are. It is a very terrible situation. Mm. Okay, doctor, I'll take you up from your point that you have made. Is this, um, are these insecurity risks beyond banditry and terrorism? And so far, what have been their impacts on the Nigerian economy, from your view? The, the impact has been horrendous. Mm. I did some basic calculations uh, recently, and I got a figure of over $100 billion of destruction and economic loss as a result of insecurity in Nigeria. Some people put the figure at about $52 trillion naira. That's a staggering amount, uh, and it, it, it's real.
really horrifying. If you look at the fact that our 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 basic uh, uh, our annual budget averages 10 billion, 10 trillion naira, mm. we're talking about far budget of five years being destroyed mm. in terms of our national patrimony. So the figures are very alarming. Mm. And how do we arrive at this figure? First of all, you estimate just the physical destruction of basic infrastructure, destruction of schools, health clinics, local council uh, facilities, uh, you know, at one level. The second aspect is uh, the fact that it stops a lot of business activities taking place. You know, people have disinvested from the north, basically. Even the northerners themselves, mm. the richest people are running away from the north, mm. taking away their money from the north. And across the country, some of our biggest capitalists are actually selling off their businesses and relocating outside the country. One or two oil barons have done that presently. Uh, then the third level is the loss of goodwill from foreign investors. Once they get these headlines about killing, kidnapping, mm -hmm. destruction, uh, billions of dollars in foreign direct investment and portfolio investment that would have flowed into our country dry up. And then finally, you have what is known as social capital. Mm -hmm. Social capital is the reservoir of goodwill and trust that enables people to work together in business and other transactions. So if I trust you and you trust me, uh, we'll do business together. Unfortunately, insecurity has destroyed that reservoir of trust. Mm. That, you know, flow of social capital that is the bond that holds communities together. Nigerians don't trust themselves anymore. They don't trust their neighbors. They don't trust their government. Uh, they are feeling very insecure. And because of that, you know, uh, this massive losses in terms of business activity. And then we can also say massive capital flight. There's a lot of massive capital flight that's in the place. A lot of the money is moving out. Less is coming in. Except diaspora funds. And this is Nigerians abroad who are desperate to help their families back home. And even then, the level of diaspora influence has slowed down. Remittances have slowed down nicely. Uh, and a lot of people who have invested in this country have taken their money out, some are relocating their businesses to Ghana and mm -hmm. other neighboring countries. So uh, the impact and the consequence of this insecurity on our economy has been very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And finally, as we speak, you know that we are just entering the rainy system. I'm a farmer myself. I have some farms because uh, I'm a village boy. I grew up in a, a village missionary village farming community and that's my background so i have some farm and i have not been able to go to my farm now i'm in hiding that i'm talking to you uh, because i spoke out and my life had been in danger so in this planting season a lot of farmers are afraid to go back to their farms so there is even fear that this year we may witness uh, farming you know there might be starvation in this country and uh, everywhere there are demands now for secession, for self-determination, Udidu, uh, Biafra, Middle Belt, mm. you know, Niger Delta. Uh, all these things lead to a massive breakdown of solidarity mm. and trust. And the consequence for the economy are just horrendous. Mm. Well, well, Doctor, you have you have painted a very gloomy picture from relocation of businesses from Nigeria to other parts of Africa, such as Ghana, like you have mentioned, and farmers afraid to go to their farms. Um, but is there 
any sort of glimmer of hope in all of this, that there just might be light at the end of the tunnel? And if there is, are there any reforms that you have seen by the government by the government, you know, the fiscal and monetary sides of government that seem to be uh, as, resp as responses by the government to the crisis so far? Well, you know, I don't know how to answer this question. You see, you can live in your comfortable house. You're holding down this post job in air-conditioned comfort. Uh, relatively secure, far from the mad and crowd, and far from the shootings. But I receive daily reports of killing, raping, behaving. In Niger, a pastor living in a rural village told me they have sacked his whole village. People have run away. They don't have anywhere to go. Passing all over. You know that day before yesterday, the terrorists went to an um, uh, uh, IDP camp. Can you believe it? IDP camp. IDP camp. They are living in an IDP, in an abandoned school. They fled their homes. And the bandits went in there and just shot into them indiscriminately. Mm. These are already people without hope. And you go and you massacre them. So I don't see any hope. The economy has virtually been on autopilot. Mm. And uh, I ask myself sometimes, oh, why, why am I bothering? You know, I can, I can pick my passport and leave the country tomorrow and live very, 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 very comfortably anywhere in Europe or the Americas. But if you have a conscience, if you love humanity, if you love Nigeria, you can never accept or even justify or rationalize what is going on. This is genocide. This is evil. And when we fail to call evil by its name, God will hold us responsible. Mm, indeed. Uh, I, I don't see any glimmer of hope until the, the people in power realize that we elected them and we are their employers. And that they behave as the servants of the people rather than the masters of the people. We are citizens. We are not slaves. We are citizens. Mm -hmm. Citizens with rights and duties. Mm -hmm. So the government needs a change of heart. It needs a change of approach. They need to show more responsibility and more compassion uh, for those that Nelson Mandela described as an unarmed and defensive people. But Doctor, would you say that the government is equipped enough or that our security agencies are equipped enough to fight um, this unsettling matter of of um, insecurity and terrorism and banditry that we are seeing on the increase in recent times? Well, that's a very important question. You know, there are two aspects to that. The first aspect is that the terrorists are, finding, are fighting basically a guerrilla form of warfare. They are using, they are deploying asymmetrical tools of warfare. And here we are sending a regular army to go and fight a regular tactical and strategic warfare against terrorists, well armed terrorists who are fighting uh, using the deployment of asymmetrical warfare. It's not going to work. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that um, 
we have an approach in this country whereby, and I don't know who made that decision, that the whole defense budget is given to the service chief to spend anyhow they like. Oh my God. You see, even America doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Russia doesn't. The United Kingdom of Great Britain doesn't do that. So you have the army chief saying recently that he doesn't know billions have disappeared. He doesn't know where the money has gone to. The new army chief. So when you say that this money should just be handed over to them as service chiefs to spend it however they like, uh, what did they do then is to send our young boys and girls into the battlefield with ragtag military equipment. Some of them, were, I was told, were using ammo tanks that were bought in Czechoslovakia mm. in 1970. Now, Czechoslovakia doesn't even exist anymore. So uh, ammo tanks made in Czechoslovakia, you can imagine how old they are. And, of course, they break down. Uh, they can't be repaired. These, these young people are mouthed down. They uh, hardly pay. Uh, I mean, this is a total disaster. Total disaster. So that's where we are. And uh, the great Nigerian army has been humiliated, has been brought down to its knees. Uh, we are living in dishonor. You know, uh, nobody trusts the high command. Nobody respects them professionally. And, uh, you know, the, if you look at the government, we also don't know which side the government is. Mm -hmm. With everything we've heard about Antami, he has no business being in government, mm -hmm. unless the government is the pathetic terrorist. This is the fact on the ground. And when people like Sheikh Gumi support him, and even the Sultan, I think they should be ashamed of themselves. It means they are sympathetic to terrorism. That is the only way we are led to believe. And this reality has torn our country apart from its very foundation. I speak responsibly as somebody who loves Nigeria, who has no ethnic or religious prejudice of any kind. But if we call evil light and call light darkness, then we are a people without hope. That is the truth of our situation. Mm, Dr. Milafia, um, I would like to know your thoughts on the rising levels of unemployment in Nigeria. I mean, according to the latest figures as obtained from the National Bureau of Statistics, Nigeria's unemployment rate currently stands at 33.3%. And that goes to say that about one third of Nigerians are unemployed. So what is the nexus between unemployment and the rising insecurity, if there is any at all? Oh, no, no. I think there is. I mean, and uh, you are very spot on on that. Uh, some econometric studies have shown that whenever uh, you have insecurity and terrorism, a lot of the young people who could have been used for gainful employment are normally recruited. They're the first soft target to be recruited mm -hmm. into uh, banditry and terrorism. So, of course, uh, they, they, they are given AK-47 and they are probably given 100,000 naira a month. And so, uh, why should they go for a job where a, a, a graduate is earning 50,000 mm. uh, a month when they are earning so much more and, you know, they can work with a swagger on top of it. So, there, are, there, are, there is a connection between insecurity and unemployment in terms of the diversion of labor to, to, to terrorism. That's number one. The destruction of economic and business activities reduces, you know, businesses that can employ people. Mm. So that worsens also the unemployment situation. And, uh, you know, so, you know, where companies are forced to relocate, they are forced to close down, 
manufacturers are reeling under the weight of, you know, this lost business opportunity, you know, uh, and then uh, general decline in business activity and profit profitability of businesses means that they are less and less in a position to employ people. Mm -hmm. And while they are less and less in a position to employ people, uh, the, 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 the government makes less, uh, uh, there's less income to tax people. Okay, uh, doctor. Yeah, I'd let you go. I'd let you go on with your thoughts. Yeah. So, reduced business activity means that businesses have less profit to declare, and if they have less profit to declare, the government has less revenue, and with less revenue, they cannot invest in those capital activities that will generate jobs growth and prosperity for all. So it becomes a vicious cycle mm -hmm. of poverty and degradation for everyone. This mm -hmm. is the reality of the situation on the ground. I'm, I'm glad you talked about business activities, um, reduced levels of business activities um, in, uh, in, an, in, an, in an area where there is um, increased insecurity. And I would like us to speak to the issue of investors' confidence and um, Nigeria's competitiveness right now. I mean, just recently we saw Twitter establish its first presence in Africa, in Ghana, and we saw an uproar of Nigerians on social media saying that uh, but Nigeria has a larger population and a larger, user, larger number of users of the Twitter application here in Nigeria. And this brings us back to the issue we are discussing. What does this say about Nigeria's current level of competitiveness and investors' confidence um, at a time such as now? Yeah, you, I heard about it myself, that uh, Twitter has moved to Ghana. Even the majority of the users of Twitter in Africa, in West Africa, are, of course, Nigerian. And this is a pattern. Nissan, uh, Bruno, Kia as well. Toyota, Kia, many of these companies have installed themselves in Ghana. Mm. And they have only one market target, Nigeria. Ghana is just a country of 32 million people. Nigeria is a country of 207 million people. I mean, the difference is there. So they are setting up in Ghana because, number one, Ghana is peaceful. Number two, it is a peaceful and stable country. They celebrated five years when electricity has never been interrupted for once in Ghana. Uh, you know, and they have a very responsible government. I mean, it's not perfect, there are challenges, mm -hmm. but it is a far more responsible government than Nigeria could ever hope to be. And uh, Nana Kufuado, uh, President of Ghana, you know, they showed him on a video, national television, uh, giving orders for illegal Fulanese herdsmen to leave Ghana immediately. And he said, and he made a statement that, look, you can't come and do your nonsense here. Ghana is not Nigeria. You mm -hmm. can do your nonsense in Nigeria, but not in Ghana. <laughs> you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So, Nigeria has become the reference point for everything that is failure, everything that is negative, everything that is destructive, and everything that is backward. Nigeria is the reference for it today in Africa, which is a big shame. Uh, and of course, we've lost so much in terms of goodwill. Also, mine. And that's why, you know, uh, a lot of the businesses, they are moving to Ghana and other eco countries. But they are real target. They are, they are really biggest market, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But you can't blame them. And nobody's going to live in an environment where he could be kidnapped, his daughter could be kidnapped and raped any moment. Who's going to live in that kind of environment? Mm -hmm. So that's the reality, uh, unfortunately. Hmm. But, Doctor, what reforms do you propose should be put in place now? Because from all that you've said, you've painted, like I said earlier, a very gloomy picture. And if we must act, um, I believe we must act now. So what reforms are you proposing should be taken um, immediately by the government? Well, um, you said 
you now said twice or the three times that I have painted a gloomy picture. <laughs> Uh, it is not my painting. If you like, we are the most rosy spectacles you have. You will still see the smell, you will still the smell and the stench mm -hmm. and the evil. I'm not the one that painted that picture. That's the reality. In fact, I have not painted it even accurately. It is worse than I have painted it. They're killing, they're raping, they're destroying every single day. Nigerians are in despair. People are wicked, people are uncontrollable in their grief. It's worse than I have painted it, my dear. Worse. What's the solution? Well, you see, the government we elected has betrayed us. It has usurped a constitutional mandate of being a government of the people. It has become a Leviathan that is sucking the blood of the Nigerian people. So they need a change of heart. Unfortunately, the English language says that you can't treat an old dog new tricks. So I, I, you know, hoping they will change is like hoping against hope. I don't know. Uh, because, you know, the biggest fear is we had, and, and Chief Olusha Gono Basanjo said this, that there is an agenda of Islamization and Fulanization. Unless this government can prove to us that they are not in cahoots with the terrorists, they need to come clean. Not in words, but in deed, and they must walk the talk. Mm -hmm. The duty of leadership is to bring our people together not to divide them. Don't rule as if it is only the people from your village or from your side of the town that matter and everybody else is scum. We need to bring the great Nigerian people together. We need to show a sense of purposeful leadership and with genuine goodwill and genuine intention. Mm. Nigerians are very generous. They are quick to forgive. Mm. And they are eager to work with you if you show them that you love them and that you have genuine goodwill. Nigerians are the easiest people in my view to govern if you mm. really know your onions. Show purposeful leadership, show courage, show sincerity, show commitment. Nigerians will follow you. They will follow you anywhere you go. They will believe in you. So that's the kind of leadership we need. And we, we must also give communities the right to defend themselves. Because the right to self-defense is enshrined in our constitution. It is enshrined in our laws. It is one of the precepts of international law and it is enjoined by universal global ethics and the norms of natural justice and equity which state that any community any people who face an existential threat to their very survival have not only a duty but also a bounden uh, obligation and a right to defend their families, to defend their community. Uh, so long as the government is unable and or unwilling to come to the defense of ordinary people, it is their right. You cannot take that away from them. So the government must empower communities to defend their territories, defend their communities. And we need to change the model by which the terror war is being waged. It is not working. It is a complete failure. We need to retrain our armed forces. We need to equip them. We need to get them ready uh, to face the enemy. 
with greater capability mm -hmm. and with a high sense of morale, which the army right now don't have at all. And let me also make this point, and an extremely important point. I heard recently that the presidents were saying that uh, they're pleading with America to come, to bring Afri come to Africa because of the challenges we are facing. This is the most dangerous and the most misguided statement I've ever heard in my life. Do they know why AFRICOM was set up? Mm. AFRICOM was not set up for, for you and me. It was set up as a military arm to protect American global interests. Look at everywhere America has been. And I'm, I'm not anti-American at all. I'm, in fact, very friendly to America. Some of my best friends are American. But look at everywhere America has intervened. That place has never worked again. Never. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, the many. And if you go by WikiLeaks, some of the revelations that came out of WikiLeaks show that the Americans even have some some remote link to some of these things that are happening. Some of the all these bandits all over the place. Let me tell you, there is a global conspiracy among the world powers. They don't want Nigeria to become a world power because they know that in 30 years' time, our population will double to 410 million. We shall be number three in the rankings of the nations by virtue of population behind just China and India, who even have overtaken America. They know we are a very industrious people. They know we are very gifted and intelligent people. They know we have massive natural resources. So it is in their interest never to allow Nigeria to become a strong, united, and uh, technologically prosperous democracy. So they are going to bring one thing or the other to try to undermine us. In fact, I believe world powers have a vested interest in Nigeria breaking up. Mm. That is why it is very dangerous. For anybody to say you should welcome Africans, they are not your friends. They will never be your friends. Never. Mm -hmm. So why welcome your enemy to come and help you? This is the most foolhardy thing I've ever heard in my life. And like I said, I am not anti-American. Never will be anti-American. Some of my best friends are American. But I have read enough of classical international diplomacy. From Renaissance, Italy, Florence, Tuscania, Roma, all these things, up to the Treaty of Westphalia 1648, to the Congress of Vienna, to uh, you know World War One, World War Two, the Cold War, till today. I think have enough understanding of the world system of power and global imperialism and the way it has structured the global political economy into a hierarchy in which Africa will remain permanently an exporter of raw material mm. and a playing field of empires. I know that for sure. So don't mistake them as your friends. They are never your friends and they will never be your friends. Okay, Doctor, I believe this is where we will have to wrap up our discussions. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but time is not on our side. Thank you again, Doctor, for joining us on the program. Thank you. Great nation, good people. I love Niger. I'm not going to lie. I have been speaking with Dr. Badaya Milafia, who is the former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria. And we have been speaking to issues around insecurity and the nexus between insecurity and national economic development, especially in Nigeria as we speak. And uh, do well to join us again, same time, same station, tomorrow, as we promise to be here as always to keep you updated on activities and happenings in the world of business, commerce, the economy, investment, as well as every other sector, basically, with relation to business. I am Chia Makainendu. Thank you for watching, and bye for now.